you're going to see a lot of them are about the process itself. You can see. Who's dealing with all those um, institutions? And you can see the budget planning is very cool. Okay, I, I, I did that before for the management, but you forget that for one minute. So you see the macroeconomic projections coming here. So you can see already under that chart, I decided to use it to show you how the policy, the macro, the sectoral policy, the framework in terms of budget planning. And sometimes policy making in terms of supply side policies, demand side policies. How do you create demand? How do you ensure that good service providers are taking place? All that can be shown here. But also the policies here international economic policy, exchange rate policy, macroeconomic policy, monetary policy, financial market, all that is here. Right? It may appear to be complex, but that's government. That's how. So it's here it's a mixture of policies and process. Right? We don't have too much time, but we can come to that if you want. But I think gradually, we, I'm, 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 I'm trying to bring you part how government works. And that's your analysis at the back of your mind, because you're not doing partial analysis. You're doing a macro analysis. And when you're looking at macro, so all that comes into so one set of, one paragraph about fiscal, one paragraph about um, your MTEF generates so much in terms of what is behind the scene there. So you have to be aware of that. So that is the beauty of the public financial management that I was talking about. You understand that you are really in control of how the government is operating. Your government. Yes, sir. You mentioned foreign aid there. For what? Foreign aid. Yes. And then I can see it there in relation to uh, debt management policies of our government. Like these foreign aids and uh, donor agencies that come into the country, they give donations, they give aids, maybe to like health and other organizations. If the government is sure of meeting up with the conditions, is it not possible that they incorporate it into Nigerian budget so that we we'll know how much is coming in as aid? Because such monies would still be paid back by the government. It's not free. My short answer with that is it should always be like that. Okay. But in reality, you would find that there are, again, like we talk about the leakages, there are leakages. I remember when I was coming regularly to Nigeria, we used to go to the planning, we used to go to one department in particular who had put some very clear guidelines, forcing defeat, I remember, forcing my program that I need to report. So it was me reporting, it was government. The recipient, meaning the DMO and other people, needed to report. The whole idea here, you need to have internally something called aid coordination department. And that's the responsibility that it should channel. It's so easy sometimes to say, well, the, government, the, the donors are not willing to collaborate. But if you put your foot down, you say, well, I'm not ask, I'm not controlling you. I just want to ensure that the money is actually going through my process. Sometimes there are <coughs> some expenditures which will never come to the budget. But these are for specific reasons. They are trying to improve the capacity of NGOs. They are trying to improve the capacity of civil society. You may decide to leave them alone. Why? Because they want to improve the voice of the nation. You know, it's about, sometimes there is what they call them participatory, participatory budgeting or whatever. Uh, you may already be doing that sometimes. Inclusive budgeting. Inclusive budgeting, whatever. So sometimes you leave them alone. But I would agree with you with what you're saying. There has to be coordination there, so I'm not going to argue against that. But unfortunately, it doesn't happen. I think there's a conflict in the house on that. All these are in the And they also interact with the national planning committee. 
And I think honestly, to be very, very precise, the issue why I think the parliament and even government have not been relatively very fair on this is when you look at uh, the level of foreign aid coming in and you compare it to the it's just minuscule. So yeah. that's why, that's true. And, 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 and in most of it, when you look at it, when it was coming through the health sector, or you were having something like eight hundred billion dollars coming in through NACA and COOL. It was, you know, kind of packaged within a government agency like NACA, you understand, for this support of HIV is and But when the money is just, you know, pittance targeted at nobody, you know, kind of civil society organizations and other NGOs, the understand government normally, you know, kind of hands off. Allow that because by the time you begin to get in there now, it's like closing that space for the civil society organizations. Yeah. I think that was actually what happened. But I could recall, you know, when this uh, what do you call this uh, formula HIV AIDS intervention, where massive fraud was discovered. Gavin. That, eh? Gavin. not Gavin. There was a massive fraud that was related to, you know, kind of intervention in HIV, AIDS, and some other things where certain organizations, you know, kind of were found to have falsified even, you know, beneficiaries' names, even training sensitizations. You give a training out, somebody will go and have a list of fictitious, you know, people, you know, people living with HIV, so whatever, 50 pictures, you can just go to a photographer, get 50 pictures, fill a form, get to arterial cause, get, you know, you know, so government decided to stay off, you understand, for transparency kind of, because if you delve in as a government, it now becomes an issue, but it's small, it's not even up to 0.2% uh, of your national budget, and then it has a tendency of bringing much more problems with you, because it's like you are closing the space that under normal circumstances, civil society organizations, you know, kind of should occupy. So if it's government, 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 no civil society, you know, kind of participation, it puts the entire process in bad light. Yeah. Because it's very, very difficult for civil society organizations, you know, for them to get funding from government. So the only outlet for them is the EFIDs of this world, the USAIDs and you know, some other uh, agencies. So there are, there are some objectives I want to but generally I would agree with you that the quantum could be very low. But I think at the end of the day, if you do have those aid coordination or those processes, I don't think any donor is, is, is ever willing to provide that information. It's just sometimes that the, they, are, they have their own conflicting needs, which sometimes you need to harmonize. And they have donor harmonization for a program which never works. In the right, right, right now there is a defeat. I think it's in, at the inception stage. I happen to uh, have a contact from within who I knew 10, 15 years back on another program when I was working with uh, the EFAD uh, project in Nigeria also. And uh, somebody, one of my staff, sat in actually when we were holding a kind of meeting. We were looking at the possibility of accessing some distance, and the person opened up to us that they are not interested in what we want as an organization, which is capacity building, to build the capacity of you know, our staff. But they are much more interested in invading themselves into our system. You understand? If we can allow some technical assistance, one or two people to come in, stay with NAVO, churn our reports on NAVO, NAVO, have access to information which we have, which is not necessarily in the public domain, you understand. So, if you look at some of these objectives, sometimes they also determine, you know, that uh, willingness of government agencies to, you know, kind of be open to such interventions sometimes. And that is why the civil society is much more, you know, kind of positioned. They are in a better position to allow that. You understand. Because as an institution, NAPRO cannot just take technical assistance where you have somebody coming in to sit in the office for 18 months and. We have access, by virtue of the fact that we represent the parliament. 
we have access to a lot of information that's not out there in the public domain. You understand information that under normal circumstances, you know, you should not just you know push out. God is strictly meant for the use of NABRO to look at and to approach the FID directly. But you know it is not possible. The FID will not deal with you directly. The same problem DMO had when they were coming up. And in the end they have to go into a strategic partnership. Yeah, that's very important so that you're not you're moving. The, the target will change, but at least you have a vision about where you want to go in the next 20 years. And I've seen that it really gives you some focus by having that. I don't want just to say brainstorming always works. As you know, sometimes brainstorming are pretty useless. Because people <laughs> went talk about everything. And then at the end of the day, what are we talking about? Oh, we spoke about everything, but we don't know what it is. But that's not the type of brainstorming I'm talking about. I'm talking about having a focused type of issues, discussing it. Bring in all the stakeholders. If you want to develop a vision, bring in all the stakeholders. Try to get the contribution of everybody. It's a bit like what you've done when, uh, if anybody has and was involved with uh, your PR, PRSP, you know, Poverty Reduction Strategy okay. It was a wide-ranging consultation going across the board, getting civil society, getting the people, getting everybody on board in order to understand what can we really do to actually improve what you call Poverty Reduction Strategy. So it's a bit like that, you know. So have a vision. Then once you have this vision, how does that vision that get translated to your medium term plan? And from your medium term plan, then you can have some real genuine investment. As I say, I call it a public <coughs> investment program. You call it you could call it your, your investment program, just investment. And you have it. You have it done somewhere there. Investment promotion com council commission. That's promotion. That's promotion. This one is a okay. set of projects. A public sector investment program. Projects. These are projects. Okay. These are areas of priority for the government, which you have done a lot of work. So it's not about just plucking them from an air. It's going to sectors. It's going to subnational even, trying to get a very good. So basically, I'm talking about. I have a vision. I have a plan, medium term, what I want to do. How can I go about doing it? So there, when you look at your sectoral plan, your medium term plan, you will find that infrastructure, for instance, will come up very high. Then you say, well, what exactly would I need to improve the infrastructure? So how do you, because you can have 50 projects that would be eligible to improve the infrastructure. That's okay. But not all of them will go into your public sector investment program. So you do your feasibility study. Briefly, you would do your analysis to find out what is really the project that's going to be immediately by your I'm not saying those other projects are not going to be useful, but you need to prioritize. You have so much money. You need to prioritize. So that's what is a public sector investment program. Right? You can call it, I would say, investment plan or whatever. Those are the projects that are all acceptable. Uh, or been agreed to meet the objectives of your plan and also to meet the objectives, hopefully, of your long-term vision. So it moves up like that. So big, less big, less big. So you can see we're moving further down. Technically, I should have reduced the size of those. I didn't, I didn't have time to do that. So usually it's like it's a big vision, a medium term plan, then you have a more money for this sector investment program. And obviously, I've simplified a little bit. <coughs> And then you come up to your annual version because then you translate. Your MTEP to some extent is working like that. You know, medium term plan, then annual budget. You know? So that's how, again, in your mind, when you're doing your analysis, no analysis of your budget, if you're doing your analysis of your, your budget as part of your macro analysis, can be done if you're not having that wider dimension. So easy to say, well, that the fiscal, this year's fiscal budget is that much. Uh, the expenditure is that much. Look at it from that perspective. Suddenly you have a different perspective. Yes or no? Are you getting what I'm saying? 
that's the type of analysis that makes your analysis more useful because you're not in a way just looking at one year's budget because the parliamentary years probably would be interested only in saying what is this year's budget giving me yeah. you're going to do that no problem and i don't think it's so difficult to actually analyze obviously after we discuss what we are discussing all the bits and pieces which you know already it's not that going to be difficult to, to understand what you're saying but then you give that perspective that analysis in terms of one of those objectives. Are we really on track in meeting those objectives? Or the, is this fiscal, fiscal this year is crisis management? It could be, because there has been some very bad period. Nigeria has been going through a difficult period. So this year is about firefighting. We just want to keep our head over the, over the world. So it could be that, but sometimes it just happens. In the same way that in our own life, in one year we realize that it's not looking very good. So forget all the rules, we just need to survive. You know. But it's not about survival. And this is why I don't believe in crisis management. If, you, if you, your policy of management is about crisis management, if a manager always manages the office as a crisis management, this is a recipe for disaster. Because you're not really managing them. This is the, you're responding, you're reacting to evil. Life is not about reacting to evil. Right? Life is also about being proactive. Sometimes you have to react because there is a crisis just behind the door. You don't know what to do. You have to take action. It is not about crisis management. So that's what I'm talking about here. Ideally, this is the way you should be looking at your budget. Your analysis also has to. So keep an eye on what is your big policy. Keep an eye on what happened last year. Keep an eye on what was happening. And your job is about reviewing anyway. So you review it, not reviewing in terms of so your, what is your benchmark for reviewing? I'm saying your benchmark for reviewing should be a combination of all of those. That's your benchmark, right? Rather than just saying, well, oh, this year's budget is going to grow by that much, or it's not growing by that much. Why is it not growing by that much? You go to the fundamentals, okay? Is that clear? So that's, so that, that's another framework which is very important, I believe, okay? And obviously, we can't avoid that. I don't know. Whether as part of your analysis you're already doing it. So then I don't need to spend time on that. This is a very important piece of work. But later when I'm going to talk about uh, the budget, uh, the government, uh, I'm going to talk about that a little bit. How many of you have seen that in the context of Nigeria? How many of you have taken the liberty to check your own fiscal framework? Is there? Yeah? Maybe they are not doing the m correctly. Who knows? I'm not saying in Nigeria it's happening, but it could be. So that is where your question should be that there are some inconsistencies you could follow. I'm not saying you will find inconsistent, but maybe when you're looking at those capital projects, when you're looking at the expenditure, you are finding some inconsistency. And the inconsistency will only be known to you if you know how the m works. How this process has taken place. Then you would be able to know that, oh, I'm seeing some inconsistency every year with the health sector. Why is that? Oh, I'm seeing that inconsistency with the agricultural ministry or with the education, no, I just said education, or some ministries, right? Then you could probably raise an issue. The minister of education maybe needs to know that he or she is new, but maybe at the, at the parliamentary level, you are raising some issues about the outcomes. Those guys, those people who are in charge of providing information about the health care are not doing their work very well, or maybe they don't have the capacity. They need help. It's not that Nigeria now has become so good at doing health Maybe there are some lack of capacity. Are you getting my point? Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, you want the budget to be a, a, a very good tool for you to meet your objectives. But sometimes, they need the capacity to do That's the only way you will be able to do it. So you are talking, you are thinking, like, oh, I'm talking macro here. How come now we've gone into sectoral ministries? But the macro will not work on its own. The actors, the parties involved in macroeconomics, or the stakeholders, they are the ones that need to be giving you the right information so that you are able to do your work very well. All right?
So that's in a way is uh, somebody was asking me about where how the budgetary process. So if you look at it here, so that's in another way of looking at the, the budgetary process. You see? You always start from here, right? You have your upstream preparation planning. The budget that is coming in December, it starts long time ago. You know your own calendar. When does that first letter, first instruction, yeah, that leaves the Ministry of Finance, goes to the to those uh, MDAs, exactly. And how much time discussions those days? When when is the time when you come to come and defend your projects to justify your needs? So there's a lot of preparation that takes place there, right? And obviously, once that happens, so you can see here, the upstream, the preparation, the planning, and then I've put it there, the downstream, the execution, the accounting, the reporting, the monitoring, the monitoring, etc. There is a, I haven't put it here, but there is a sequence in what I call the budget cycle. I didn't think it was important, but in case you want to know it, I can insert it in your final thing. I think you know it yourself. Your own Nigeria budget cycle, when you start this. I decided not to put it here. I was just trying to give you a phrase. Right? The downstream, all that, but also the legal and organizational framework. Because how do you actually do all this stuff? Which have we have already seen, so I'm not going to mention that. Pretty straightforward, right? Yes. I hope. Yeah. Okay. So I just wanted to, before I sort of move on to something else, mention something I, 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 I talk about the PFM here. It's about your investment decision. The big danger for countries like Nigeria and other countries is that with the advent of new forms of implementing projects, I can see that there are some potentially, I'm not saying it's happening in Nigeria, but I'm saying that you as the, as the organization that was helping the parliament to write, ask the right questions, I do not want to see saying I do not want as if I'm under decision making. But I would not be happy to see you doing your analysis in this way. That way. You're analyzing projects, traditional projects in one way, then you're leaving PPP projects outside the system. Unfortunately, this is what is happening in our countries. People think that PPP is too complex. It is outside the investment remit. So if you do that, you're missing a big trick. I would urge anyone who's doing analysis about investment, they talking about budget or outside the budget, because they all come back to the same thing, about your investment plan, about economic growth, about macroeconomic performance, right? Because they are all, Never believe that, and I think you know it, but I have to say it. Never believe that because if a project is not within the budget, this means that this is outside your remit. You're talking about the macro performance here. The PPP project, why are they being set up? Why are we implementing PPP projects? The reason why we're implementing PPP projects is because there is an investment need, I hope. It's not because the private sector has come and con you into investing in your project. No way. Nigeria is too wise to accept that. So it's always about the investment plan for the government. So you've decided that I can't afford this PPP project. This project, I can't afford this project. I will have to look for outside money. But because those outside money will also bring me them expertise, mm -hmm. techniques, which I can process. Right? So you use the PPP. There's also a danger now when we talk about PPP, Oh, private sector. As if the private sector is not involved here. Traditionally implementing project. Is the private sector not involved here? It is. No, they are fully they are involved. They are not? They are fully involved. They don't need to. <coughs> Only contractors, <coughs> well. But who are they, the constructors? They are the private sector. So you, we, we have a tendency in our mind. This is, this is the way the brain works sometimes, unfortunately. The moment we say traditional ex implementing uh, implemented project, we are saying that as if, oh, now we are bringing private 
have it sent into government business now. Government matters. But you always used to do that. There's no government in this world who tells me that they are starting a project and implementing it themselves. You always, obviously you're taking the risk because you are funding the project yourself. You are funding the project from your own sources or from your own borrowing, from either money. But who's implementing a road? For the last 20 years, 30 years, who's been implementing roads in Nigeria? Is it the Ministry of Works? It's been the private sector. You tender it, but the news about traditional project is that you're not, you're keeping the risk to yourself. The big difference between a PPP and a traditional project is that you are sharing the risk because they are moving out some of the risk outside. They're bringing the money, they're bringing the technology, they bring the and if it is a boot project, build on operate, or it is build on operate transfer. So hospitals, everything like that, you do that for that. But that's the big difference. So you always been using it and using the private sector. But the only difference here is that sometimes this one is not appearing under your balance sheet. And yesterday when we were finishing our conversation, I mentioned to you, just be careful about it. So I wanted to leave that here to tell you that always when you're doing your analysis, don't do analysis separately. If a PPP is coming, always ask the same question that you would ask for a traditional project. So when you're looking at capital projects, don't ignore those projects also, because these are projects that are implemented on behalf of the government. These are not projects that are coming out of the blue, right? And that's the only way you're going to be able to get value for money, getting the best out of the PPP. You're not going to get the private sector to get a free lunch out of it, because they would know then that you have done your work, you have done your investment analysis, because the investment analysis is the same. There's only one investment analysis. Only one. Investment analysis or investment needs. We will talk about GDP calculations in Nigeria uh, later. But I took the liberty of just very quickly talking about the closed economy. What do I mean by closed economy? No transaction with the rest of the world, which is not practical. But for analytical purpose sometimes, it's very useful just to look at this concept of investment and service. So here there's nothing. Production, national cake, which is a bit, I've used that a lot. So you have your GDP, your income, which you can, this one is one, later we're going to look at more things. So consumption, your investment, where consumption can contain of private government. So investment can be government, private again. On the other side, you will have income, how the cake is used, you can consume, you can sell. And it depends now on what type of people we're talking about. Those who are, or which type of economy, in many, if I was talking about the same thing in the 70s, in the 60s, in the 80s, you would find, for example, a lot of the income of those type of economies would have been what? Would it have been C, would it have been S? What would, where would you have seen it? A basket type case of the economy, where the population, the level of income is very low. What would you expect? When I look at consumption and savings, it would be mostly consumption, because you're talking about basic goods. It's not about buying a refrigerator or buying a television set. People are not thinking about it. People are thinking about subsistence. But obviously, as we move on, we're going to see that savings here. So income is consumption and saving. So this is simple identity. I'll come to in more detail when I'm, but as I said, this is more introduction to it. And C is equal to the same income in here. Replace the consumption as investment, consumption as saving. So you have your investment as saving. So in a closed economy, what is it showing here is the economy is Make the economy relies solely on the amount of savings. So if my economy is not saving at all, so will I be able to invest? So technically, it's telling me here that I can't invest. So 
end of story. But I will just go ahead. There's nothing. But luckily, this is the closed economy doesn't exist anymore. It's okay. But it's quite easy to show. Uh, this is the first thing. Uh, just I wanted just to show you something about how your economy. When we do a bit of you would have this is out. Modern Nigeria. Yeah, closed economy. Yeah. This is out. It's not available. Your saving is coming from somewhere here. And I'm not saying you're printing money. So let's for one minute forget that you're going to print money. <laughs> so you're artificially creating more money. So what are the savings is that in the economy? Whatever money is in the new creation is, is coming from that. Can so we can we have an example of a particular country's economy that's really close to a close economy. More, you know, apart from North Korea, maybe? No, not even there. I think there are leaking. There are a lot of things happening which you don't know. You and I don't know. Flows, there are loads of flows happening. Somebody told me that, for example, Sudan or South Sudan or wherever, they have been not out of Sudan. Um, they were, you know, even an institute like Crown Asia, I have to be careful when I go and work in Sudan because I could not get paid. Because if my, if my the bank realizes that I'm earning income from Sudan and uh, that money goes to a bank and that bank, somebody in the US is looking at their financial transactions. They say you're breaking the rule because they said I'm all good. Yes. Right? They can find billions of dollars. Yeah, so for, what is it? So, so well, for 1,000 pounds, let's say, they might be fined millions. I don't know how much. So, so but that's an official thing. At the moment, what do we hear in Korea? They say that they are involved. You should, you are not allowed. They are involved even on Russia. Remember that because of the Ukraine. But are you telling me that there are no transactions here? Are you telling me goods are not going to South Korea, to North Korea? They are enjoying it. Okay, they are not enjoying it as much as before the free world, so-called free world is enjoying it. But people are still trading with them. So it's very difficult for, for me to give you one. I'm fine. Oh, I was going to come to Zimbabwe. Zimbabwe, the amount of transactions that are taking place there. It's amazing. When I go to Zimbabwe, I there's no way yeah. it is on North Korea and Iran before. What you well, I happen to be in Iran. Cuba. Cuba. <laughs> what you can't well, Cuba is open now, so. What, 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 so you can't even use an ATM in the back of you. <laughs> Not as a foreign <laughs> yes, you can't. So there's a bank, you are a resident of that country, a citizen, but you cannot even. Because they were shut out completely from the you know, kind of global financial system. In the old days, maybe you could find some example, but nowadays with, with all those transactions, it's not, also, it's not that easy to control. But Zimbabwe is certainly not one of the Now, Zimbabwe has dollarized the economy. Okay, they're using the US dollar. But when I go there, I mean, you, would, you wouldn't think that this economy is suffering. Amount of activity can increase. The amount of restaurants they're opening, the number of people visiting. It's a lot of them. Obviously, the the political side is a bit of a problem. And I mentioned to you about the wages making up about 80, 70% uh, of their budget. Oh, yeah, well, yeah. But on the road, transactions are happening. So I just wonder sometimes what is really happening. So this BOP that I'm going to talk to you about in the future, does it really capture all those transactions? Maybe there are leakages. You're going to see in the, in the BOP, there is a, if you do BOP analysis yourself, you know there is something called Errors and omissions. Yeah. There's an item there. I'm going to show you. Errors and omissions are supposed to be this item whereby you can't classify them under all any other transaction. In many countries, these errors and omissions is so massive because they can't account for why those flows are there because the, the account is balancing. I can't explain whether this is foreign direct investment. What type of? It's not debt. It's not uh, relief. Debt relief. So where is the money coming from? How come there is money there? So they put it under areas and conditions. So it's very difficult to get a closed economy. But the good idea here, I'm just showing to you that the only way to understand the closed economy 
and the open economy is to look at the closed economy, right? So this, so it, it's it's not the right way to show it to you. But when I show you the real economy, I'm going to show you that how income is equal to sum of value added, how it, uh, your GDP is equal to sum of value added, how GDP is equal to consumption plus investment plus government expenditure plus uh, private uh, private consumption x minus m then how it is equal to when you look at that then you're going to see it very well here yeah, we're just trying to show you in terms of budget so here the government is able to have a higher investment plan in simple terms why because it is able to get money either from grants and the grant will go where does the grant go because the tax rate is so high that they don't want to see the then you see the population they're mining on their own because the government does not provide any enabling environment or any revenue market where they can mine and sell and they smuggle it out and sell it and now you go to charge the same person tax how do you think he will feel? Yeah, yeah. because you didn't make any provision for him that if something happened to him in the process you will take care of it you don't provide any safety net, whatever, for you. So I think the government is to do that. If they want to, maybe they can even formalize some of the sectors, because especially the solid minerals. You know, we know we have a lot of it in the They can make it formal by providing market, providing the regular environment, to the mega, whatever framework that is required, just to see that it goes on smoothly. I 100% agree with you. I would say that in two minutes, you've probably articulated Nigeria's mining policy. That should be a policy. I and mean, if it is, I mean, again, when we do sectoral analysis, when you're looking at this, what can, what other, you know, potential, potentially you have a lot of those uh, mining, those out there sitting mm -hmm. there. And, and I 100% agree with you. When you talk about diversification, when we have a chance to talk about diversification, one should make a critical analysis, a feasibility study. Government could do that. So I, on that point, I would agree with you. The informal sector, one minute before we come to that. The informal sector, how does the informal sector grow? Because the informal sector is, you're finding the, the breed of people, Nigerian or non-Nigerian outside, wherever you go, they have to survive. They are looking for opportunity. Yes or no? There are two or three ways of looking for opportunity. The easy way which we, we, when we are sitting here in the office, we might say, there are people out there, they say, well, the best way to earn some money is to go and steal. But forget about that group, stealing or whatever it is. Let's talk about those who think, well, the government is not helping, but have found a gap in the market. So if there are some gaps there, I suspect when we're talking about diversification, the unit that is involved with diversification, they should listen a little bit about where potentially those sectors are. If mining happened to be, like we rightly pointed out, to be a sector that is still going on on its own with no support, no environment, no taxation or, or regulatory, no nothing in terms of market, etc., then what is it that needs to be done to make mining an industry on its own? You know? Obviously, government cannot do everything. I'm aware of that. But you're right there. I'm not so sure what whether government is not doing anything. So no, you're telling me. I, I tend to disagree. <laughs> I tend to disagree. Yes. 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 The, 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 the mining sector is not completely informal. Mm -hmm. There are policies, there are regulations. There are regulations. Yes, concerning the mining. Exactly. The only thing is, we, in the past, our, the, the government's attention is not very much there in the implementation of those policies because of the oil uh, revenues and others. But now, what is happening today in this country is that the government has turned back to those policies implemented. You can see yesterday or day for yesterday, you can even hear the announcement of a new uh, nickel founding. So there are integration and implementation now around. And if you still go to the Ministry of Solid Minerals, you still find those yes things uh, existing. Only that is not completely formal, but it's a formal sector. I, I think what I will add to that is we should refrain from maybe saying it doesn't exist. Somebody yes. can say, you know, to the best of my knowledge, 
for instance. Yeah. You see, where you see informal mining taking place, you understand? In most cases, let me tell you the sad story, switch of that. Let's continue now. Um, in the same spirit of uh, our discussion so far, let me try to introduce again some framework, some additional framework. And um, before we do that, just to reiterate some of those issues that we discussed this morning. Uh, and we've uh, just mentioning that whatever else we're going to be talking about, so keep in mind those framework that we'll be looking at. A bit uh, the whole concept of uh, macroeconomic objectives, the whole concept of uh, policy, which we are going to come back times and again when talking about Nigeria, but also thinking of the PFM framework and all the bits and pieces, which we will keep reiterating because, like I said, um, when you're looking at the Nigerian economy, there's no, in terms of the framework itself, it's not that complicated in terms of what is there. It's more about the interpretation. So, inevitably now, we're going to look at, essentially, a framework that is pretty useful when we look at the system of national accounts which I put there. When we look at a little bit of the government finance statistics, DFS, GFS. These are all manuals available for you to look at in case you are the most interested. And then there is the so-called financial programming, which is a very good framework to look at how an economy is structured in terms of the various accounts. And all of those, when you look at the similarity, the common common elements, or even if you, when I was mentioning to you yesterday about other uh, models that you can have, the World Bank have this RIMSIM model, which I mentioned a little bit yesterday. And as I said, you, you may ask them one day, when you see them, your country officer about whether they are updating uh, the one on Nigeria, which is a general macroeconomic model. It's called revised minimum standard model. Which you must have one for Nigeria, which they use. It's a comprehensive model. Or if you're using things like SAM, which is social accounting metrics, or if you're using the input output model, etc. The common element along all that, like I said, we, we don't have time ourselves to go into deep, delving deep into that, but this is not a textbook type of uh, program. It's more hands on and more practical. But inevitably, you're going to see that the, se the sectors of the economy. They have the similar, similar. You can't avoid the fact of the two concepts that I'm going to introduce now, and very quickly, because it's a short presentation, then we'll move on to the sectors. It's those four sectors of the economy, because these are the building blocks. And then the other elements related to that are the, what I call the economic agents. So two elements which you, again, would be very much familiar. So the more familiar you are, so the less time I have to normally have to spend on that. But inevitably these are what I call the building blocks also, it's a continuation. You can't avoid that. Whichever framework you're using, when you go into the system of national accounts, so when later, our next session after that, that one, when we're going to look a little bit closer, again, because it's national income, it's the, uh, disposable income, savings, the way it is actually structured in the case of Generally, as per the SLA, <coughs> but more specifically in terms of what Nigeria is using, 
you, you have to go back again to those elements, okay? So that's where I'm starting, but it all depends, like I said, uh, how, how much uh, you know already about it, so I can go very, very quickly. If you just shout, but let's move on quickly. So the objective here is to look at what I normally call the real sector, the government sector, the external sector, the monetary sector, and also delve a little bit about the, the household, the firms, the government, and any other parties that are dealing with the rest of the world. So these are what I call the economic agents. And um, so to some extent that will have to become natural. And I said, if you're already doing your analysis, you are already looking. And when we look at them, we're not just mechanically looking at them, but we are trying to understand how do they behave, how do they react. So all your policies that you're talking about, what the government is doing, etc., it doesn't work. I mean, can you imagine, for example, you are only having one agent, which is the government, and the government is trying to influence the rest of the population. They need to understand how the, the population, they need to understand how the other economic agents are going to react. Yes or no? Yes. And that's what we're trying to find out. How effective is fiscal policy? I keep men mentioning that the model, the economic analysis, is not that difficult. The more difficult one is its application or understanding whether it's going to work or not. Or trying to understand whether when you're implementing this, what's going to be the, the impact. And that's the most difficult one. Because we are not in the laboratory, we're not in the normal lab, the science, scientific lab, whereby you know already what you're going to expect. So even if you are trying to experiment, let's say the first time you are trying to do a, a new thing, you are already having in mind that I'm going to develop a queue for this. So you're going ahead and doing it, sometimes with trial and error, you know, and, and as you know that uh, in the medical field they normally don't use humans. Initially they use, uh, unfortunately, they use a, a different species, like the mice, whatever it is, to look for it. But at least they know what they're looking at. And when they get the result, sometimes they are what you call side effect. But the side effect are sometimes minimal, or, but at least they will tell you. But in our case here, these, this is what we're trying to do here. Yeah? We say we are analyzing, we are trying to do something about whether, how, how do I analyze the Nigerian economy. But there are so many unknown factors. So go back to my question that I said, you are trying to, use the tools that are available for government. And we had some interesting discussion before the break in terms of uh, policy sectors and whether informal sector or formal sector, etc. But it's all about behavior. How do you expect the population to behave? Right? How do you expect the population to behave with too much taxation? How do you expect the population to behave by putting in place some structures around poverty reduction, etc.? Is it going to work or not? So that's why I'm saying, we're not, I'm not mechanically just introducing them because I have to, but also think about the way they behave. And that's where you can understand how sometimes it's difficult to understand how to do policies. Policy is, is very easy on paper, but it's very difficult on in practice. Mm -hmm. And that is why you always have to keep it in mind. And the word fine tuning come up every time. How do you fine tune your policy to make it and show that you are on the right? Sometimes trial and error. In the same way like in the laboratory, you're saying that I'm trying by to try to find a solution. You need some trial and error on even in economic policy making. It may not work. Sometimes you have to say that you've got it wrong. And in every economy they get it wrong. How many times have you, you you may have been reading about the Fed? You know in the US they have the Fed. They, they, they design they decide about whether to do the QE, I was talking about yesterday, they are the one that actually says that enough is enough now, so I'm going to stop doing QE, or I'm going to raise interest rate. And then they got it wrong. Yeah. They immediately get it wrong. Why? Because by raising the interest only by half a percentage point, what has happened? They have turned back the economy back into recession. And that will tell you it's an advanced economy, the informal, there's also. Everywhere there's that now, but I'm talking about the level of informality in the sector is probably less. So immediately the impact comes clear. And they have to accept that they got it wrong. They have to change the course. And this is exactly what happened this year. When they decided, the Americans decided to say, well, we are going to stop the queue. 
you are still they announce it. Because the economy, the American economy was doing quite well. The job employ the employment creation was pretty good. And they decided that well, if we are doing well so the, we should stop using it. So remember the whole concept of QE was to give more money so that there's liquidity, production and all this type of thing. But then there was an impact on countries like Asia and Nigeria, whereby the moment we heard that Q is going to disappear, this means that less money is going to come to our own country. So there was a fear that this is going to create a problem to Nigeria, a problem to other countries like Nigeria. Why? What it means is that the, the less money means when you go back now to look for the cost of investment, the cost of borrowing or whatever, cost of money, you find that you will have to pay higher. So the world is already, and if you pay higher, this will impact on your own economy problem, not in the, in the way that we're talking about. So policies are there. So it's always about keeping an open mind, but you need to be able to ask the right question. So let's go back to what I'm saying there. So those, in your case, can't help it. This is also basically what one is about. So I'm not being just theoretical here. You also have to look at, in Nigeria, how those sectors, how those economic agents are being used. So you will see that every time I start, but I'm not going to spend time on that. I always say, remember your objective. The reason why I'm repeating myself is, remember any analysis is, why are you analyzing it? So you must have a clear objective in terms of what you're doing. Here we're talking about macroeconomic analysis, so I'm looking at my objective, I'm reminding myself of the objective. I'm also reminding myself about how those big objectives that can be turned into practical. I mentioned that already. You see, you have the growth, you have the price, you have the GDP, etc. So I'm not going to talk about that again. But uh, just to remind you again on this one, some more meat into what I already mentioned, in case you want to refer to it as in your end up. You can see here, we always like to have those policies. But remember sometimes by achieving one, it may have a, an impact on the other. And this is sometimes the beauty of economics, but the dangers of economics. It's not compartmentalized. They are all interrelated. One, one decision you're taking here has an impact on somebody else. And the impact that you expect may not be the same. So this, just few illustrations here about these objectives are slick. Sometimes you will find that by achieving this objective, you are also doing something else there, which you need to be aware of. You can see here, high inflation may not be good for growth. The latter may be affected by prices rising. Higher prices affect purchasing power of population, spend less, affect demand for goods, profitability of goods. This all makes sense to you, right? Yeah. Because these are common, common, common requirements. And that's the type of analysis when you're looking at your own macroeconomy, you'll be looking at well, what is this doing? What's the implication? So I'm just listing them to you. Again, higher prices may lead to higher interest rates through money supply affect investment as cost of money growth. So everything is very much related. And that's the macro. But on the other hand, somebody may say that, oh, you are wrong there. Because I could expect that if interest rates go up, that may be good for me. Somebody might say that if interest rates go up, that may be good for me. It means me, as an economic agent, I am also a household. What would you like? To earn more interest on your savings? Yes or no? Yes. So you could see the perverse nature of economic analysis and economic policy. On one side, you are criticizing it. On the other side, you say, oh, no, it's good. So then you have to decide what is the impact in net terms. When I raise interest rate, what is it going to do? It's very good for the household, but it's not good for the firm. Why? The firm is, is, is going to be penalized. Higher interest rate they mean the cost of borrowing and the cost of investment go up. When they go to the bank, when they try to find more money, they say, okay, sorry, this is the cost. So when they're designing a new project, you know, when you do your project appraisal, when you're doing your feasibility study about a new project, you have to put in a higher cost. So when you're doing your net present value, what is my return on that investment, you know, you understand the present value, right? So when you're looking at how much costs, so investments, then when one year I don't produce anything, but second year now I start producing. So over the time, you will find that you need a higher profit in order to 
to make to become sustainable, to become to, to bring in that that's all right. So so that's that's again I keep coming to those narratives because that's the whole idea about the economic analysis. There's no magic solution. As I said, it would be easy if you were doing something scientific. I just give you a list and say, well, if you're doing your analysis, just follow that. No. Here you have to use your judgment about what is the impact. So sometimes two impact are working together. Then you'll have to decide where should I stop or where should I, which one should take precedence or not. So you always have to be careful. And not doing over the top, doing exactly what I mentioned to you about the US. They just moved their interest a little bit and then suddenly there was a recession. And the last thing that Americans wanted is the French office, some form of recession coming up first. And assuming exchange rate is fixed, real exchange rate without pressure. So that's the other side of exchange rate. So you can see in one in one slide here, here I've sort of summarized those issues that we can keep discussing when we talk about the Nigeria Right? So that's, that's, I thought I would mention that. Before we go, and I, I think yesterday I mentioned that, but I'm, for the first time I'm putting it there. We will come back quite a few times about that. But policy makers have different policy options. So you know